Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear all participants, and it's our pleasure to welcome you to this special talk series. Firstly, would like to greet the Honorable Head of Department of Architecture, Universitas Indonesia, Dr. Insinyur Ahmad Heri Fuhat, Master of Engineering. The Honorable Chief of Ikatan Arsitek Indonesia Jakarta, Arsitek Doti Windayani IAI, who joined via Zoom meeting. The Honorable Head of Architectural History, Theory, Criticism, Vernacular, and Heritage Cluster, Professor Kemas Ridwan Kurniawan, ST Master of Science, PhD. The Honorable Our Speaker from the Berlahe di Nusantara team, Dr. Petra Timmer. Ibu Dr. I Yulia Lukito as the moderator, Bapak Insinyur Budi Sukada IAI as the commentator, and all participants join virtually in the Zoom meeting. Welcome to the special talk series Guanua, Berlahe di Nusantara. This event is part of the Berlahe di Nusantara Roadshow program, which invites us to commemorate the 100-year journey of architect Henrik Petrus Berlahe to the Dutch East Indies in 1923. Today, we will trace Berlahe's thought, works, and sketches through the presentation and discussion that Dr. Petra Timmer will deliver. This event is organized in a collaboration between Department of Architecture, Universitas Indonesia, the Berlahe di Nusantara team, also Ikatan Arsitek Indonesia, Jakarta. I am Siti Arfa Anissa. I'm Rizky Dwika. We are the MC of today's one one special talk. To start this event, we would like to check. Uh, we would like to invite Professor Kemas Ritwan as the host of the event to give his remarks. Please welcome Professor Kemas. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, and best wishes to all of us. Welcome to the Wanoa Talk Series on Monday, 9 January 2023. Please allow me to welcome all guests and participants, both who attend offline and via online, who have been willing to spare their time and energy to be able to attend the Wanoa Talk Series this time entitled Wanua or entitled Belahe in Nusantara. On these special occasions, I would like to give my special thanks to Dr. Insinyur Ahmad Heri Fuad, Head of Architecture Department, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Indonesia, and also Architect Doti Windayani IAI, Chairman of IAI Jakarta. Miss Angeline Basuki, representative of Berlahe di Nusantara. Our next speaker today, Dr. Peter Timmer, an art historian from time, and also our commentator, Bapak Insinyur Budi Sukada IAI, an architecture historian and also uh, member of uh, senior member of IAI. Our moderator. Dr. Ing Yulian Nuriani, an architect historian from UI. Some of our distinguished guests included uh, Pak Suhati Hartono, President of Ecomos Indonesia, Mr. Remco Fernmelin from Dutch Culture Advisor for Indonesia, and also Mr. Max Mayer from China. Also, all guests, invitees, and participants that I cannot mention one by one. It is an honor for us from the cluster of history, theory, heritage, and pentecostal studies, Universitas Indonesia, to host this important event in cooperation with the Department of Architectures FTUE with time the Lache di Nusantara and EIA Jakarta. The figure of Henrik Petrus Berlage is perhaps less well known in the realm of architectures in Indonesia because there were still few historical traces connecting him with the history of modern architecture in Indonesia, including important remains of a building in Surabaya, namely uh, Gedung Singa, or the Achemene Matskapai van Levens 
Verzekering en Lieferante de Amsterdam's General Company of Life Insurance and Living Benefits Amsterdam, which was built in 1901 when Belaga was still living in Amsterdam. This important legacy has become an important sign for the transitional phase of Indies architecture in the archipelago from the previous 19th century architectural traditions, which is dominated by neoclassical language to the early 20th century modern Indies architecture in Muslimtara mixed with sometimes mixed with Art Nouveau. In addition, Bella recommends and praised for the cone screen building by architects P.A.J. Muyen in Menteng, Jakarta, also gave encouragement for the Indies architects at that time to the further search for early 20th century modern Indies architectures. I personally have more curiosity about the connection between the Lache influences in the early 20th century modern architecture in the archipelago. So it was very interesting to see last year's Instagram post yeah, about the Lache, which unintentionally turned out to reconnect me with Miss Angie Basuki and then continue meeting with Dr. Petra Timmer and Mr. Max Mayer. And thank you, Ms. Angie, Dr. Petra, and Mr. Max, who has committed to realizing the commemorations of the 100th anniversary of the Lache visit to Indonesia. And the One Night Talk series will open this series of commemorations as a concrete collaboration in digging deeper about the Lache. We appreciate this initiative. Therefore, I welcome the efforts of time, the Lache in Santa, and various related parties to make a book and publish the contents of the Lach personal journal, diaries, sketches, and his poetry collection during his visit in Nusantara from the original document entitled Mine in this race or My Dutch in this journey. It is an important findings in order to explore more the hidden history of uh, and also uncover the great history of architectural change and transformation in the archipelago, especially during ethical policy and decentralization in Dutch East Indies. Mm -hmm. Belaka presence in Indonesia, although seen too short from March to June 1923, has provided important clues about the history of architecture in Indonesia and opened up new views about the Lache attitude and interest in architecture in the archipelago. Ladies and gentlemen, I should not speak too much because we were waiting for Dr. Petra speaks. And to end this speech, please allow me to apologize if there are things that are not pleasing in organizing this event, since before, during, and after the context, please. Also, my special thanks goes to all the organizers and community who work amazingly to make this event a success. Without all of you, this event could not have been carried out properly. Please enjoy listening to the presentation and discussion about Belaka di Nusantara in this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kemas, for your insightful remarks. Next, we would like to invite Mrs. Angeline Basuki as representative of the Bella Hedi Santar team to give her remarks. Please welcome Mrs. Angie. Okay, uh, thank you, Anissa, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Berlahe di Nusantara team, uh, I would like to thank to Universitas Indonesia, uh, Bapak, Bapak, the, the chair of uh, Department of Architecture, uh, Bapak Ahmad Herifuat, uh, our moderator, Ibu Julia, and uh, our commentator, Bapak Budi Sukada, and especially to the the team who already prepared this uh, event, uh, our Department of Architecture team, and Professor Kermas, who who become our our glue to 
to invite everyone offline and online today. So, well, I'm not really preparing anything, but um, it was started a couple of years ago. Uh, Esther van Stekelenburg, our dear friend uh, of me and Petra, uh, she rediscovered the, the journal that Berlaha made about his journey to the Dutch East Indies 100 years ago. Uh, in 1923, he traveled through boat to Dutch East Indies and visited cities in Sumatra, Java, and Bali. And what, what is interesting about it that Berlaha actually wrote not only about architecture, but the colonial situation the social gap uh, in that is happening there, and also the the his fascination toward the culture of the East per se, and so we think that it is very interesting that this journal hasn't been uh, translated into Bahasa Indonesia or English. So uh, to celebrate uh, the 100th anniversary of the journey, me and Petra and Esther, we decided to, to start uh, selecting uh, the quotes and uh, presenting it to the world uh, and particularly Indonesian. Uh, well, first to, to celebrate, but more importantly, uh, actually to open a new discussion uh, to the people of today uh, and to reflect on the thoughts of Berlaha, whether is it still relevant today. So I think this kind of discussion uh, is really a good start for us. And entering the year of Berlaha, 2023. So thank you very much, everyone. And hope you enjoy the afternoon talk. <laughs> and I'll give it back to Dwika. Thank you, Miss Angie. We would also like to invite Ibu Doti Windayani to give her remarks from the Zoom meeting. Please welcome Ibu Doti. Yeah, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Shalom. Namo Buddhaya. Om Swastiwastu. Salam Kebajikan. Rahayu. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Indonesia Institute of Architect Jakarta Chapter, we would like to appreciate Wanua, Universitas Indonesia, Professor Dr. Kemal Sridwan Kuniawan, Sajian Teknik, Master of Science, PhD, Timur and Mayor, and Berlaha Nusantara to start our activities in the year of 2023. We are honored today to have lecture from distinguished speakers, moderator and commentator, Dr. Petra Timmer, Dr. Ing Julia Lukita, Senior Technik Magister Design, and our former Indonesian architect chairman, architect Budi Sugada, that honors diploma AAAI, and also distinguished special guests and participants. We highly appreciate to have collaboration like today, research dissemination between academic and practitioners. AI Jakarta has heritage and conservation. Sorry, Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, we highly appreciate to have collaboration like today, a research dissemination between academic and practitioner. Ia yeah, Jakarta has heritage and conservation cluster or division, and we have uh, some program for heritage and conservation competency and develop design guideline studies to, to protect all necessary Jakarta heritage open landscape. At this moment, we collaborate with the PDA, BPPI, and Universitas Isakti, and we are welcoming other institutions to enrich heritage conservation vision for our city. Uh, the issues today, Hendrik Petrus Perlaha, father of Netherlands modernism, influencer of young Dutch Indies architect on his era in Indonesia. 
this year, 2023, we celebrate 100 years of his travel to Indonesia. Travels influence his thoughts and work. 1911 to United States with a Frank Lloyd Wright, journey in Europe, and in 1923, on his 67 years of age, he exploring Indonesia. He got his gold medal from Royal Institute of British Architect on his 76 years of age. Belaha is a very passionate architect for us. Today, we will hear more about Henrik Petrus Belaha, thoughts and words. Yeah, we like to thank you for all speakers and participants and have a nice, insightful afternoon. Good afternoon, Salam Mistari. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu Loti, for joining us today and also for the support of the ADI to our event in UMI. And now we would like to invite the head of the Department of Architecture, Universitas Indonesia, Dr. Ahmad Heri Fuad, to give his remark and open our special talk today. Please welcome Bapak Heri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here with us offline and online for attending this wonderful occasion, Wanua, Wacana Ruang Arsitektur Nusantara or Special Talk Series on Nusantara Architecture. Today, the talks will discuss about Perlache in Nusantara, particularly in Indonesia. And today we have special guest, Dr. Pitra Timbal, as speaker, and also Pak Budi Sukada as commentator, and Ibu Yulia as uh, moderator. On behalf of the Department of Architecture, allow me to give you one welcome for both of us, and also to express my appreciation to Prof. Kemas, with um, History, Theory, Criticism, and Vernacular Research Group. Also to Time, also to uh, Ikatan Asitek Indonesia Jakarta Chapter, and Architres.ui, who organized and make this seminar come true. I would like to express my gratitude to our special guest, Dr. Petra Timmer, as our speaker. Once again, Mr. Budi Sukar as our competitor, commentator, and Gu Yule as our moderator. Also special thanks to Ms. Angelina Basuki, Berlaha di Nusantara. Also Mr. Max Meyer who being here for this us. And then uh, I don't have to uh, talk too much. Then I would like once again, uh, thank you for all of you. And please enjoy this warm discussion this afternoon. So I open the discussion. Yes. Um, Formally, I open the discussion today. Please enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Bapak Dr. Heri. To all participants, before we move to the presentation, please turn off your microphone during the session. The Q&A discussion will be held after the presentation. And we also invite all participants in the Zoom meeting to turn on the camera. We will take a screenshot for a documentation that led by the, mod, the operator. The participant in Zoom meeting can please turn on your camera. We'll take a screenshot. Okay, the first page, one, two, three. Next page, the second page. One, two, three. Third page. Next page. Okay. 
Okay, next page. Okay, thank you very much. After this, we will move to the main event. Uh, the presentation station will be moderated by Ibu Dr. Yulia Lukito. Let me introduce her profile first. Ibu Yulia is the associate professor in the field of architectural history, theory, and criticism in Architecture Universitas Indonesia. She finished her bachelor degree in Architecture UI, got her master degree from Graduate School of Design in Harvard University, and doctoral degree at RWTH Aachen University. She is currently doing research about architecture and the ideas of modernity in Indonesia, a negotiations of space and culture, and development of technology and modernity in the Dutch East Indies. Please welcome Ibu Yulia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for introduction. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yulia Nuriani Lukito, and I will be the moderator in this special talk series Wanwa of the Department of Architecture with the theme uh, Berlaka di Nusantara. So this event is part of the Berlaka di Nusantara program with Ms. Uh, Angeline Basuki as representative, yeah? And uh, to, set, to commemorate the 100 years since uh, Berlaka came to the Dutch is in this in 1923. Actually, my first encounter with the Berlaka archive and uh, journal is uh, like a decade ago when I did my research in the Netherlands and here we are in this room discussing about Berlaka's thought and uh, words and the relevance yeah, to our time. And it will be through the presentation and discussion with uh, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Petra Timmer. Uh, Berlaka is considered the father of modern architecture. This is what I uh, got the idea from my education, and this is what I pass also to my students. Yeah, and uh, it happened in the Netherlands, and it also spread the idea of modernism to Indonesia. So uh, what I believe so is like um, he's also he was the intermediary between traditionalism and uh, modernism uh, that also inspired many architects during the 1920s, yeah, um, including like um, the famous Amsterdam School, the steel and new objectivity in the Netherlands. And here we're going to discuss also the funds uh, from the works that we uh, the have two uh, projects in, uh, and uh, works in, in Indonesia, yeah. So his ideas travel like long way to Indonesia during the Dutch is uh, in this era. So before the presentation, I would like to introduce our distinguished speaker. Uh, Dr. Petra Timmer, PhD, is an art uh, historian specialized in the 19th and 20th century European art and decoration. And she, is, um, she has an international museum and heritage consultant uh, with the Office of Time in Amsterdam. Dr. Timmer studied art history at the University of Utrecht. And she got PhD in 2000 at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam. Uh, so she has been working for over 25 years as an independent curator, researcher, author, lecturer, and consultant. It's amazing uh, uh, CV. <laughs> and since 2007, she was co-owner of Time Management with uh, co-founder Max Mayer, which is also here in our room. And then the office has some work which focus on cross-cultural capacity building, museum development, and heritage project, and also promote mutual cooperation uh, between countries, yeah, uh, like Indonesia and the Netherlands. So Time Amsterdam has been involved in heritage projects in Indonesia, such as training programs, assessment and consultancy, and that commission from Ministry of Education, Culture and Science of the Netherlands, UNESCO, and also Kamandik Booth, yeah, to mention some of the projects, yeah. Uh, so here we are, um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Petra Timmer, uh, the time is yours. Okay, thank 
Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Is this okay? Because I have my microphone here, it's a bit different distance than you have, so I hope this is clear. Thank you very much for being here, being invited to give this talk. I'm very happy. Uh, Angie already introduced Berlach, the Nusantara team, and uh, of which I am part. And um, let me see, is this big enough? I have my speaking notes over here that correlate with what you're going to see. Uh, Iqbal, can I have the first uh, slide? So. In the meantime, I can tell you that Berlach was very well known to me as an art historian since many, many years. But doing this research into his travel to uh, his journey in, the, in Indonesia, I really have got the feeling that I got to know this man better. And that is, um, well, I'm, I'm very happy with this, uh, this extra knowledge and it's kind of inspired me in different in several ways. Yes, this is the start of my talk. Berlach de Nusantara, a journey of the architect um, H.P. Berlach in the Dutch East Indies in 1923, a cross-cultural relevance uh, and, insp and inspiration in, 2023, in 2023. Yes, oh yeah, I'd like to give you an overview of this talk. Um, it, it consists of three parts actually. First, a short introduction again of this Berlag, the Nusantara project. What is our, our goal? What do we want to, to, to achieve with it? And how does it start? did it start? The second part is, well, simply to say who is HP Berlag? I guess uh, a lot of people in this room and also who are uh, online know quite something about HP Berlach, but maybe I can give you some more clues about his ideas and his and his work. The third part is Berlach's journey in the East Indies and his travel book and what we made of it for now. Yes, next next slide. Yeah, this is Berlach, the Nusantara, uh, uh, our project team. Uh, in the next slide, you can see us working, but let me tell a little bit. We are a small group of architecture and heritage professionals and enthusiasts in the Netherlands and also in the Indies, but in, in, in Indonesia. And we rediscovered Main Indische Reis, the, na the name of the travel book that Berlach wrote. Uh, during and after his visit to, in the, to the Dutch East Indies. And we rediscovered it some time ago. Um, and it's partly a rich historical source with a lot of information and beautiful sketches that he made during his trip. But most of all, we were surprised and intrigued by its modernity and relevance with issues of today. And we actually wondered if you, young Indonesian architects, but also academics, researchers, and creatives would be triggered too. So, and that's why we made this new Berlach travel diary. We translated it, parts of it, into Indonesian and English, and we tried to translate it or to transmit it to the 21st century, and we called it Berlach di Nusantara. We made a working book, I can show it to you here. And then this is what we presented to several parties in Indonesia and also in the Netherlands to see how they react to it, how we already can discuss about it in order to make a new book and um, uh, an exhibition and whatever may come out of this. This is our working group, Berlach Dino Santara. It is a historical source made accessible, not only as an opportunity to dive deeper into a shared history, but also as an invitation for dialogue, for discussion, for research and creation. 
history can also be creative, as one of the people we recently met in Indonesia said, and I thought it was a very, um, well, I thought it was a very inspiring uh, expression. Well, of all these reactions and inspirations, we will make a compilation and that we will incorporate in the final book that we're going to make about uh, Mijn Indische Reis or Berlage die Nijsantara. That's what we're later going to make. And all these people are kind of co-creators of this book. It's a new journey. Uh, well, here you see us at work. This is, uh, I chose this. Uh, photo, you see myself, but with Esther, Esther von Stekelenburg. Uh, she was already mentioned by, by Angie, uh, and she was one of the initiators, like we are, of this project. So that's why I showed this. This is the working book in progress. And uh, beneath it, you see the original version, in which I can show to you here now. This is the original book of Berenhagen that was published in 1931, so several years after his journey in the Indies, with a very nice uh, uh, logo that was uh, designed by his daughter, who was a, who was a designer. And um, so I'll put it here again. So this was our source. And what we did is taking quotes from this source and give it a context and to translate it. That's what you see in this book. Um, can I have the next slide? Who was the architect Hendrik Petrus Berlage, or Hein, as he was called by his family and friends? Hein Berlage. Well, he was born in 1856 in Amsterdam and died in The Hague in 1934. It was a small and quiet man with his typical pointed beard and with a modest, gentle character. Not a debater, not a fighter, you might say, but a little man with big thoughts and big convictions and a man who created a turning point in Dutch architecture around 1900. He wrote many influential books, articles and lectures on architecture, art and society. And his work and ideas had a great impact in the Netherlands, but also internationally. So for instance, in 1923, Erich Mendelssohn, that's a German architect, he stated, Berlage is the conscious break with classical eclecticism, the end of romanticism, the rediscovery of the elements of building, the first in Holland and apparently in Europe. Another very famous architect of, I think that you, you know him very well, is uh, Mies van der Rohe, and he was a great admirer of Berlage and said he was a lone giant, which I think is kind of funny too, because it was a very a little man, but he called him a lone giant. And he called himself a loyal follower of the Apostle of Truth, Bernard. Apostle of Truth, something to keep in mind. And at the first SIOM or SIOM conferences, the, the International Congresses of Modern Architecture, in Switzerland, La Serras, in 1928, Berlage, already 72, was a special guest invited by the organizers, Siegfried Guillaume and Le Corbusier. He was invited as the grand old man of modern architecture, uh, like a veteran of the, of the modern architecture. He was the only one of his generation that was invited and came to this conference. And Berlage, he gave a, a debate fueling uh, uh, in, uh, speech about the relationship between state and architecture. And that was, um, well, it, it fueled the, the debate in the conference, actually. So he was still uh, an important man for the modern architects of the generation after him in the Netherlands, but also internationally, to give a little context of who is Berlach. Um, may I have the next slide? 
some of his major, no, actually his major works. First, I have to mention, of course, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange that finished in, in 1903. Um, the Urban Extension Plan of Amsterdam. He was not only an architect, also urban planner and an urban uh, designer of 1915. The Hunting Lodge of Sint Hubertus in the Netherlands. And finally, I want to mention to, to show you something of the, uh, the Art Museum in The Hague. And that was finished a year after he died. Uh, next slide. Here you see the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. This was actually his magnum opus. And it became his breakthrough as an architect. Uh, later on, I will talk about his formative years and the ideas, his, 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 uh, his formation as an architect. But this is the outcome of the first um, well, his theory and ideas about architecture, and this was uh, an amazing building in Amsterdam at that time. People were completely blown away by seeing this modern architecture. Maybe today it's, it doesn't seem so modern for, for, for our eyes because we are accustomed to, to, uh, to well, modernism, of course, but for that time it was completely something completely new and different from what people saw before. This building established his reputation. I only have here two slides because we're going to talk about other things too. Uh, this doesn't do justice to the building uh, and it is hard to photograph it. It's quite big and, and it has a lot of details that are very interesting. But here you see two sides, one of the, the long sides that's at the Damrak and uh, and you see in the above you see the um, the entrance from the south side. This is a drawing. Who is talking? Oh, okay. Well, let's go on. The next slide. Here we see the Amsterdam uh, extension plan or Amsterdam South, Amsterdam South. Also only two images uh, of 1915. Um, the, the, the plan was, was executed in the 1920s and 30s mostly by other architects, not by Bayerlager himself. And this is a part of Amsterdam that, we, that is um, uh, filled with Amsterdam School, the, the, the famous Amsterdam School, the, the Dutch Expressionist architecture. Um, uh, partly it is, well, the, the, the planning is, uh, is have approved of this completely. Next slide, we see um, the, um, uh, the hunting lodge, uh, um, Sint Hubertus, um, that's in the middle of the Netherlands in a, in a big uh, nature park, well, meant for hunting. It was a commission by the Dutch Kruller Muller family. Uh, one of the richest family in the Netherlands, a shipment company uh, established in, uh, in Rotterdam, and uh, they had this hunting lodge built by Bernard. Uh, it's an extraordinary building. Maybe uh, you, you see some of the interior later. Then I'd like to go to the next slide. Here we see the, uh, the art museum in The Hague, only a part of it. This was finalized in 1935, as I said, so Bernhard hasn't seen the final, the, the completed building, but he was proud of it. It's his other, well, you might see his major, his major work, he had the stock exchange of 1903, and this is 35, more than 30 years later, the Art Museum of The Hague. And here you see this kind of reflective pond also on the other side, you have a, a similar pond, and it's a, it's a beautiful and, and very impressive building. Um, furthermore, 
There are two buildings in Indonesia, as you have already, uh, as already was mentioned here. Um, the first one in Surabaya, um, for the insurance company, the Algemeene, uh, it, as it is called, Gedung Singa, from 1901. And the other one is a building here in, in Jakarta, uh, then Batavia, and that was the office of the insurance company, the Nader London from 1845, and that was executed in 1910. Well, next slide, we see Gedung Singa. Um, well, the black and white picture that is uh, of the period itself, that is when it was finished in 1901. And you see on top of it the, the name of the, the insurance company, the Algemeene. And next to it, you see a picture of only uh, two months ago that we, we were there in Surabaya and uh, visited the building, not the inside, it's not accessible at the moment. But um, this is from, uh, well, the other side of the the, uh, the Kalimas, the river. Uh, it's in a quite bad state, um, although it should, should be able to, to, to be restored. Everything, it's completely uh, original, authentic, the building. But it is, um, well, um, not very well kept at the moment. Um, in the top, you see two photos of two uh, features of this building. The one is a, a tile tableau by the Dutch architect Jan Torop. And the other one are these famous uh, winged lions that are in front of the building, uh, a design of Joseph Mendes da Costa. And uh, well, this is what the, the building is often called after, the, the Gedung Singa. And what is special about this is that it's probably one of the first, even before the, the stock exchange, which is of 1903, and uh, one of the first buildings of Berlage that you see his, well, idea of Gesamtkunstwerk, that he works with other artists. I'll get back to that later, but here I can show it to you already. Jan Torop and Mendes da Costa, who, Form part of the complete idea of the architecture of the uh, of the design of Berlage. Berlage knew about this, of course. He must have invited them. Then the next slide, we go to the uh, the building of which I just mentioned. Uh, the other insurance company that was built in Jakarta or in Batavia then in 1910. Um, it's a quite a modest building. Uh, I think it's in a, it has been restored yet, and also the interior. Well, there are still some original parts in it, uh, but it has been modernized. Uh, this is in Kota Tua, and um, what is very peculiar about these two buildings, if we realize that Berlage was in Indonesia or in the Dutch East Indies in twenty three and he was in Surabaya, and he was, of course, in Kodatua and he, in, in Batavia. He wrote about architecture that he saw there, but he didn't mention with one word his own two buildings in Indonesia. Why was that? Well, that's a question I'd like to pose to you later. Um, but we are certain that he saw his buildings. It cannot be that he just, uh, he hasn't seen them. That's not true, he has been there. For instance, this building is just across what was then the Java Bank of Kuipers and Hillsmith. And he writes about the building of the Java Bank and he, which he described as a weak kind of modernized Renaissance. So um, if he just had turned around and looked at the other side of the street, there was his own building. So it's not true that he hasn't seen them. He um, uh, deliberately ignored his, his own buildings in his, in his travel diary. Uh, this nowadays is the Museum Bank of Indonesia, this Java Bank of, uh, of Kavers and Hillswitz. Very a huge building. I'd like to go to the next slide. Um, about Berlage, uh, his training as an architect and his and what influenced him. Well, he studied at the Institute for Technology in Zurich in Switzerland, 
1875 and 1878. And it was um, um, uh, an institution, a, a new technology institution that was founded by, uh, by Gottfried Semper, uh, an important architect and art theorist of uh, Germany. And um, he was very influential for Berlage and Berlage's own theory. I can't go into that very, very uh, long because that would take really another lecture. But I can just like the ideas of Viollet le Duc, the French architect and restorator, very important for Berlage's ideas um, about architecture and about the truth in architecture and, and making a new style in architecture. These are very important for him, but it takes too long to really get into that in this in this lecture of mine. Um, a third influence in his formative, his younger years, is the architecture of Pierre Kuipers. Um, not to uh, uh, he, he is the the uncle of the Kuipers that we know in Indonesia. Um, but this Pierre Kuipers, he is the, the Dutch architect, neo architect neo-Gothic architecture, and he built the Rijksmuseum and Central Station in Amsterdam. While Bernhage born in Amsterdam, he saw a lot of these buildings, and in a way it was very influential, important to him, but he is also um, uh, an opponent, you might say, of Kuipers. So this has, this has both ways, but he, nevertheless, Kuipers was an important uh, influence on Bernhage too. And the next slide, traveling. Um, I think it was also already mentioned that Bernhage was uh, uh, an architect who traveled a lot. He, he really loved it. It was very important for him. And after his graduation in Zurich in uh, 1878, he traveled intensely through Europe during three years. As an extension of his formation, he was really looking to, um, well, the, the kind of buildings that Semper was writing, was writing about, especially in Italy and Tuscany. And, um, and there in, in Italy, in the years 1880-81, the Romanesque style and the early Renaissance architecture that he saw there, that was really very important for him. And we see back in his early architecture. He traveled through Germany, Switzerland, France, and the Netherlands, of course, very often. That was quite close by, so I didn't give it a certain year. He, he went there several times. An important uh, journey of his is to America in 1911. Uh, yes, 1911. Um, it was partly uh, a, a, a journey that made for him clear the, the neoclassical buildings that he saw there, that is the, the wrong way for him. That is something that he, uh, that he rejected. But he also came across the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. And that for him was a very important architect because he found in uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you might say a same soul, someone who was searching for a new kind of architecture, an architecture that fitted uh, his own surroundings, his own uh, uh, American uh, landscape and an, Amer an American tradition that he tried to find back and that he incorporated in his style. Frank Lloyd Wright was important for Berlage. Berlage promoted his work in certainly in the Netherlands, but also in Germany. He was one of the people who made Frank Lloyd Wright well, well known. And then he, this one became a, a great influence to many architects, as you apparently know. Um, and then, of course, the journey to the Dutch East Indies that we're talking about today in 1923. And as the last big journey of his was to the USSR at that time, so Russia, as we say today, in 1929. Um, most of these journeys, he made diaries, he wrote about it, or it was articles that he wrote for, for newspapers. Uh, so he spread it 
to a wider public. And he made often sketches, not all the time, but there are more, not only the, the, the Indonesian trip, but also of other trips, he made a lot and a lot of sketches. So that was something that he liked to do. And it was also his way of getting into touch with this architecture, with this other culture. It was his way, not only writing, but also drawing. Next slide, about developing his style and theory. Well, you might say there are a few things that he was very much against. Against all 19th century neo-styles, especially neoclassicism, he, he, uh, he thought bad of that. Abundant decoration, that's something that, that, that he didn't like and he thought that should be, um, we should abolish that. Hiding constructions and materials, ignoring the character of materials, pretending luxury. During his, his early formative years, Berlage had come to the conclusion that we in the West, we had made, you might say, a wrong turn somewhere in society and in architecture. And this, where he is against, they, these are the symptoms, you might say, uh, the symptoms of an architecture and maybe a society that, in his view, was in decay. We should be, should try to find a new way. So this is what he is, he is against. And then a few examples of contemporary architecture, more or less contemporary of his time, uh, we see a kind of neoclassical building in um, uh, the right in the right corner. This is a church in Amsterdam. It's older, but this is a kind of a neoclassical building. This kind of buildings, he was thinking this is the wrong way. We have to find a new style and a new architecture. He, um, well, I show you also the, in the, on top is uh, an interior by Victor Horta. He is, a, he is a, a Belgian architect, a very well-known architect in Belgium. This is in Brussels. And with this languishing lines, all these curls, and well, this is really what we call Art Nouveau. Uh, this is something that uh, Bernard didn't approve, that, approve of at all. This was the opposite of what Berlage stands for. And the small picture of the chair I show you here, this is a tonet chair. And what happens here is that it is a very simple chair, you might say, but what happens is that the wood is bended. And Berlage is someone who says you have to follow the natural the naturality of the of the wood. If the wood it grows straight, then you should follow the straight lines of the wood and don't do things with the wood that are not inherent to the character of the material. That's one of his rules, you might say. So this is also an opponent of what Berlage is. Next slide, we go to the transition phase that he felt that he, he was in, and that what made him an, an innovator, that he is in search for a new contemporary style, in search for truth, honesty, and modesty. That's just, that we have to, that is a very important uh, quality of his work and his, his findings. An arch architecture, but also, uh, uh, things that we use, the interiors, the, the uh, design, should be fit for purpose, local conditions and circumstances that we have to keep in mind and we have to look for. And he was looking for a unity of style, construction and decoration. It should be one unity. Berlage, he felt we were heading for a new society. He wanted to return to a phase of pureness, of simplicity, then make a new start and development from the basics. That was actually what he was doing. That's also why he was interested in this Romanesque style and uh, this uh, early Renaissance architecture in Italy, not to look for a new style to copy, uh, a new neo style. No, what he wanted is to, it is a very pure and simple and modest style. 
but it's a very strong style, and that is what he chose. Um, that was his, his inspiration for a new architecture. In this phase of transition, of optimism, you might say, of searching, Bernhard developed his own architecture theory and practical aesthetics. As I said, honest, modest, and solid. His solidity is something we really find in his architecture. It's very strong and bold. He is looking for a balance between functionality and beauty. And he is actually not propagating a certain style or a fixed set of rules, but he is looking for, and he developed um, a coherent, coherent guideline for further development. And this is what he called rationalism, or what is later called rationalism. That's a re rationalistic way, a rational way to, uh, to develop architecture, to, to develop a style. But to give you an idea of what this rationalist style, what are the, the uh, um, what it is about, first I show you. Yeah, it's it's. I'm afraid not a very um, a very good picture, but I couldn't find another one. But I wanted to show you here. This is an important feature of Berlage's designing. It's a, this is a part of one of the walls, the outer walls of the, uh, the stock exchange in Amsterdam. And he is designing according to a modular system. It's a proportion system. Of course, he's not the first and not the last, not the only one who does it. But for him, it was a, an, 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 a way how to make a unity in style, how to make a good proportion. And what he uses here is what is called the Egyptian triangle. I hope it is clear that you can see this tri big triangle, smaller triangles, and everything should fit in this modular system. Even the smallest part of an architecture uh, design should fit in this system, and that's a way to, to get to unity. A second, yes. Um, a second element of his rationalism, architectural construction and materials should be, well, if possible, indigenous, uh, national and visible, uncovered cast iron constructions, for instance, and brick walls. What you see here is uh, on the left side, the interior of the, the big hall of the stock exchange, in which you can see the, um, uh, the iron construction of the roof. It is completely visible, it's not uh, hidden, it's not, it's not um, uh, concealed by uh, uh, decoration or, or hidden away by, by uh, something that covers it. Uh, you can see the construction, it is clear, it is uh, honest in his, in his view. Um, uh, on the right hand, I show you one of the walls uh, of the art museum in The Hague. So now we are 30 years later, and he still uses the bricks. The brick is a Dutch indigenous uh, material. Uh, he wouldn't um, approve of, for instance, using marble in the Netherlands because it's not an indigenous material, but making bricks, that's something that uh, that it's very common, it's very logical to do it, and it's a, a cheap material. Uh, so he uses bricks, and actually he uses bricks also on the inside of interiors. He doesn't want to plaster it, he doesn't want to hide it. And at that time, showing a brick wall without covering, it was amazing, especially when you do it in, on the inside, of in the interior. People thought it was, well, something, it's too cheap, but he, he wanted to make a beautiful, and as you can see here, he made a beautiful design of it. So that's his way of showing modesty and honesty. And in the middle, I show a detail. It's a an, an, uh, cast iron lamp from the hunting lodge of St. Hubertus. And here you can see the, the riveted nails visible, the riveted nails of the, uh, uh, of the cast iron. 
They form part of the design. It's not a fancy decoration, but construction visualized. That is uh, something that is, is, is a hallmark of uh, Berenages designing. Then we get to uh, rationalism three, reintroduction of color in architecture. Well, this is something that really came from Semper, actually. He also discovered the coloring also of, of classical buildings that was um, discovered that they had a lot of color instead of being white. And this is something that Berla reintroduced also in the Netherlands, the color in architecture. Here we see the interior of this hunting lodge. One of the rooms, this is a study and smoking room of Mr. Uh, Kruller. And we see the hall and stairway of, well, it is called the ANDB building. It's, in, it's a building in the Netherlands, in, in Amsterdam, which um, was executed also in 1901, if I'm right. So in the period that he was working on the stock exchange, and as a matter of fact, also on the building in uh, Surabaya, same period. Well, you see the bricks and also the colors of the bricks and several colors and here the bright yellow that he uses. That was something new instead of the white walls. Uh, a fourth element, decoration should stress mark the construction. We saw it already, but here I show it in another way or symbolize the function and significance of a building. And what I show you here, is uh, on of the interior of the uh, art museum in The Hague. This is also with colors, but also with a lot of white. But what I show, wanted to show you here, this is a, um, a constructive joint, but this is stressed by a modest decoration. So decoration should stress construction and not, a, not be well, something that you just add to a wall or whatever, it should have um, a kind of a function or stressing the function. And then I go to a fifth element of this rationalism, and that is a building sculpture should not protrude, protrude from the wall surface. Something that we didn't see um, uh, the, the, in, in Surabaya, there is something happening with the two winged um, uh, lions. Well, I'm not sure what that means uh, related to Berlage's ideas, something we can try to find out. But in general, he thinks that the building sculpture shouldn't protrude from the wall, from the profile. And here you see two examples uh, in the stock exchange. Uh, on the right side, for instance, that is a, a, a sculpture of, of uh, I don't I think I think it's Gijsbert uh, van Amstel, but I'm not quite sure. But he, if you would see the wall, it, it's within the corner. It doesn't protrude from it. And the other one, you can see this is in, an, uh, in, a, in a bow construction and uh, it doesn't come out of it. You see it stays inside the, the stone that, 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 that finalizes the, 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 the bow construction. Then I would like to mention some very important element, not especially of the rational, rationalism, but his idea of a Gesamtkunstwerk. It's an expression that's taken from uh, Richard Wagner, the, composer, the German composer, and he wanted to make um, an, an artwork, uh, well, his, his music, his operas, but with other artists working on it, um, that they make a, a work of art that is one complete work of art in one style, in one idea. And this interdisciplinary um, uh, group of art uh, of artists, they were invited by Berlage. You can see it uh, in the stock exchange. And we saw a small example of it in Surabaya, also with two other artists who were invited to in the idea of the building to give their, um, to make their designs. Here you see, um, well, this, this sculpture group, but beneath it, you see a poem 
by Bernard's friend Albert Ferrey. And there are several of these poems in uh, texts in uh, the stock exchange and texts that are very meaningful for the, the complete idea of Berlage about the meaning of this building. They all had the same idea about the meaning of this building. So that is his idea of Gesamtkunstwerk. Then I go to another element, which is important to understand who is Berenhage, and that was he was a socialist. A socialist, um, well, I call him a utopian socialist. Um, he had, um, well, an, an ideal, a big ideal about what would happen in the future. He believed in a better and more just society in the future to come. And architecture as a community art form had an important role in this transformation. He believed that capitalism, in his eyes, a decadent and unjust system, that it would end, in the end, would be overthrown. And after that, a better and more just society would emerge. And architecture, well, as I said, it had an important role in this transformation. And later it could serve the new functions and the new purposes of the new society. That was his idea about architecture and, for instance, the stock exchange. Um, another element is the element of spirituality and culture. Bernard's rationalism has a strong spiritual and philosophical layer Maybe the term rationalism that may seem strict and matter of fact like a prosaical, but that is a limited, a superficial description of this architecture movement. It has a strong spiritual and philosophical, philosophical layer to it. So it's kind of lopsided, it's a bit uh, restricted to one part of it. They call it rationalism, he calls it rationalism, but there is another part of it. And that is has to do with feeling, with art, with soul and spirit. As a matter of fact, Berlach, he always searched for a balance, a synthesis of the rational and the spiritual, of reason and emotion, of structure and form, of function and beauty. And for him, this was the essence of a true culture and also for good architecture. And I say this because this is what we will find also in his journey in the East Indies. He, that is what he finds here and he is so happy to find it and he's amazed with what he sees here. That has to do with this part of his feeling and his importance as an architect. Well, then I go to Berlach's influence and importance. Um, well, we call him a pioneer of modernism, a father of Dutch modern architecture. And um, by his important and impressive buildings and brand new style, he was an influencer, a pioneer, but also by his publications and lectures. That is how his, his ideas were, were disseminated publications and lectures about his views on the role of architecture in society. He had a strong influence on Dutch architects, but as I said, also internationally, for instance, if you look at the, the Siam, Siam conference in 1928, he was also seen as a grand old man of uh, modern architecture. Um, seen as a pioneer of and as a father of Dutch modernism. And here I'd like to cite, uh, to quote Thomas Karsten. I think you all know that the architects and city planner in the Dutch East Indies. And he said in 1923, we architects, architects in the Dutch Indies, we architects are all influenced by this great master builder, directly or indirectly. None of us can match him. That was the idea of Thomas Carson, whom uh, Berlach met uh, extensively when he was in the Dutch East Indies. But Carson kind of venerated this grand old man, this master of Dutch modernism. 
Well, he inspired several Dutch architectural movements, and they are very diverse. He did influence the Amsterdam School, or the Expressionist architecture, the style, the constructivist architecture, and functionalism or the modern movement or neue Sachlichkeit. And in the next slide, I give some examples. Yes. Um, here you can see left on top an example of Amsterdam school style, which is very organic. Uh, in a way, trying well, it is the, the brick work that he that are is used here, but in a way that apparently uh, Bernhard wouldn't approve of. Um, then you see an example of the cell. This is the famous Rietveld Schroeder house in Utrecht by uh, uh, Rietveld, Gerrit Rietveld. And um, here you can also see the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright with his horizontalism, for instance. But he, as a functionalist and as an, a constructivist, he was very much influenced by Berlage too. Um, and on the, the two right on, on the right side, the two buildings, you see the Vanelle factory in Rotterdam, uh, an icon of modernism, of, of um, and a modern style. And below we see um, uh, the, the, the yeah, it's called the Zonnestraal of the architect Duiker in Hilversum, and uh, that's a sanatorium. White walls. Uh, concrete, uh, much of, uh, much glass that you use, much glass and and uh, iron and and steel. That is, of course, the conspicuous elements of the modern movement. Not exactly what Bernhard was propagating, but still this this functionality, which is part of his rationalism, was a great influence to these architects. Um, then I'd like to go to the next slide, the travel to Indonesia. How am I in time? It's 10 past three. How much time do I still have? Can you tell me? You know? 10? Okay. A travel to Indonesia. On board of the Grotius, I said it was hard for me to believe that I was actually traveling to the Orient, fulfilling a wish that I had always cherished but not thought achievable. So in 23, Bernhagen, he was already 67, he makes the longest travel of his life to the Dutch East Indians. And we can ask, why did he go there? Some suggest that he was looking for new commissions. Economic low tide in the, in, in the Netherlands might have uh, fueled that idea. But my impression is, that it is exactly what he says in this quote, uh, uh, it's kind of a dream that come true. He always wanted to visit the Orient and to see the, uh, the, the Orient and to, to, to go to the Dutch East Indies and to see the Eastern culture. And why then? Well, he did have an important commission by the Dutch government to advise about the controversial restoration of the Prambanam. So that's what he visits. Um, uh, he makes a long visit to Pramanan and also to Borobudu. Um, and he had a series of lectures. The man was a great lecturer for the Kunstkring members in Java and Sumatra. Uh, and as before, he makes a travel diary and a series of sketches, and it would be published in 31. And that is, you've already seen it, that came into this book. We made, as I said, a new version of this book, which is a draft at this moment, a selection of quotes divided into four themes, and that I will present to you now. And I limit myself to the quotes about Java, because Berlach's experiences in, ba in Bali and Sumatra would take another lecture, so I leave them now. So we go to Java, and let me see. As a matter of fact, this is a beautiful drawing of the ship that took him to uh, to Indonesia. Um, but in the next in the next slide, we see. Yeah, can you give the next one? Berlage the Traveler. That's our first chapter in our working book, Berlage the Musultara. Berlage the Traveler. Um, 
This is about what he feels, what he sees, about the scenery, about the people, about places, and the overwhelming nature. It's about gray, uh, um, shades of green that he sees in the landscape, and about the gracious gestures of Javanese dancers. And we meet a light-hearted Berenach who roams the streets of the indigenous neighborhoods sketchbook at hand. Um, what we see here in the right uh, uh, lower picture is Berlage arriving at the port of Tanjung Priok. This is March 23. And we see him in a white tropical costume uh, wearing a white tropical hat. This is Berlage arriving in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, we see a very nice illustration, right, the, the above picture, uh, illustration that was made by Fitri uh, Joni Putri. She is an illustrator from Jakarta, and we worked with her. She made several illustrations for this, this book we made and uh, putting him, showing him in, in situations that we knew here he is traveling by train, looking at the landscape. And so we have some very nice uh, illustrations by her of situations that Berlage was in. And we have, uh, you see here, his itinerary in the Dutch East Indies, the Indische Reis, uh, from uh, Sumatra till Bali, and in between there is Java, and the many cities that he visited there. In the next slide, this is also one of the illustrations. This is a situation that Berlage describes in his book that he was in invited at the Sultan's Palace in Jokja and um, he attends a Serimpi dance. And he is sitting here in, in his, uh, uh, well, in his costume, his, his Western costume with a um, uh, white tie and, and, and black, uh, I don't know how you call it in English exactly, but it's a very, it's a gala costume. It's a very official costume. And he feels himself kind of ridiculous or foolish uh, when he had to sit here and looking at this beautiful Serimpi dance. Then I have my first um, quote about this. Can you show it? Yeah. The beauty of the stylized movements of these perfect creatures remains with me unforgettably. It brought tears to my eyes. The feeling very much. Tears to my eyes because this beauty approaches the sublime, that which is not of this world. And later he says, the West is no longer capable of such an expression of beauty. So he's critical about the West, about its culture, and what he encounters in, in, in the Dutch East Indies or in Indonesia with the people, the culture from Indonesia. He is completely overwhelmed by it. This is one of the moments, the dances. Then another one of Berlage, the traveler. He, this is on Surabaya. The Rotterdam of Java, and here about the Arab Quarter, um, of all its counterparts in other cities, the most interesting. Its main street leads to a mosque with a tower whose silhouette is most charming. I walk through its unplanned center, as through any ghetto, is therefore a bizarre pictorial delight. He loved to go through the indigenous, the, 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 the kampongs and uh, this kind of, of, of uh, vernacular buildings and vernacular uh, kampongs. That's what he loved to see and to describe and to sketch. This is one of them. Then I'd like to go to the next one, Berlage, the architect. And here we see a sketch of his of the Pramadan temple complex, which was quite ruinous at that time. And, um, well, I am Berlach, the architect, is the main part of our book. And some longer quotes I would like to present to you here. He is fascinated with traditional Hindu-Japanese architecture, but it takes him some time to appreciate what he sees. But then he comes to an extraordinary insight. And then go to the next slide. The character of their architecture has led many art experts to deny the people of the Orient have true architecture. This is unjustified, of course, 
but understandable for those whose judgment is de determined so solely by the dimensions of the space enclosed. For this is five minutes, where Western architecture finds its glory, all the more so because it is the work of a constructive spirit, the result of technical skill. The stouter the structure, the more magnificent the space, which undoubtedly reflects a cerebral, cerebral appreciation of value. But is the spirit of the West not governed by reason, that of the Orient by feeling? This is an important quote. Um, I see that I have five minutes, so I pass go to the next one. Um, something he says about the ornament of astonishing beauty. First, he doesn't understand it, but now he understands that um, the, 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 the realization of beauty lies in the ornament in the Eastern, uh, Eastern architecture, the Hindu Javanese architecture. And oh dear, why then is the modern West which has also had a tradition of decorating its buildings about this to give to 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 give all this up. Here he's talking to fun, functionalism. Something about critical about his colleague architects in uh, in uh, uh, the Dutch East Indies. Here we see a uh, Kala head um, on an, um, uh, the majestic cinema in Bandung by Wolf Schoenmaker, Schoenmaker, and he disapproves of neoclassical buildings and about modern architecture that include Javanese inspired style elements without maybe understanding what it is. This combination of Javanese, Javanism and um, uh, neoclassical or art deco architecture, he disapproves of. This has to do with his honesty idea. Well, this is what he says, every stylized lion's head, a gala cop or gala head, above a modern doorway is a caricature. So this is his criticism to Wolf Schoenmaak. Then I go to the debate in uh, architecture, architectural circles in the Dutch East Indies at that time. Um, that was in the Indies Spaukundig Tijdschrift, that they were, uh, well, it was that fueled this debate. Uh, architect Werlage uh, took um, um, a position in this, though very cautiously, but he did take position on the side of not Wolf Schoenmaker, but more about the, the side of uh, Nathalie Pont, you see in the, the lower picture, the portrait, and on the right side, you see a picture, a portrait of Karsten, um, uh, uh, Thomas Karsten. And it may seem a debate about style, but it's also represent political controversies concerning Western supremacy and colonialism on the one side and more Eastern identity and emancipation that in the end could lead to independence. Well, this is about, and then I have to finish, um, the part, at the end of this, this quote is this development about the, the Indonesian architecture, which presupposes that the Javanese himself has a fully fledged, is a fully fledged architect, will keep pace with the movement towards an independent East Indies. In the next slide, we see, well, the Pendopo as an architect, as an archetypal structure. Um, architects like Karsten McLean Pond, Suryo Winoto, he wanted to use indigenous building practice, form, constructions, materials, as starting point and inspiration for a new Indonesian architecture. Bernhard fully agrees. It clearly reflects his own theory and practice. And he too, like them, considers the Pendopo as an archetype, as a typology for a new architecture. And that he said, you can compare with what the Greek temple is in Western architecture as a Base, basic. And this is a sketch of Berlage of a Japanese house, a traditional Japanese house in Samara. Next slide is about Berlage. Um, he advocated in a confidential meeting 
the establishment of an architectural department at the Technical College in Balloon. He talked with the then director uh, Klopper of, of the ITB, of the uh, Technical College in Bandu, to start with this architecture, uh, the architecture uh, faculty department of, of this uh, uh, of the ITB, and also to make uh, Javanese uh, uh, men and well, maybe women come there and to have their, um, their formation as an architect. So they become independent architects who can design the architect of the future of Indonesia. That was his idea. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I skipped this one. This is about Spengler and the ideas of a decadent society, but I already said something about that. Um, but here you see that the, the difference he sees between the decadent society in the West, and you can see even the uh, in the right picture, you see, well, I think it is New York, or at least it is a big city in America. And on the left is one of the, the photos in his collection of the Dutch East Indies. And here you see the countryside, the people, the animals, nature. Living in balance with nature is something that he uh, assumed to be a part of the culture here. And that's something that he was striving for. Well, maybe this one I can add, what typifies the bustle of the Orient is the silence. In the bustle of the West, it is the noise. The Orient still knows the rhythmic movement style as the natural quality of all things, which differentiates art as an expression of culture. The West has long lost that. Western influence is threatening to rob the Orient of this quality as well. Well, I wonder if that's true, but it was his idea. Um, last thing is Perlage, the critic. He feels uncomfortable in this colonial setting. He is irritated by the behavior of some Westerners he meets. He is appalled by the colonizer's misguided sense of superiority, as he says. But what probably hurts him most is seeing how the indigenous culture crumbles from intrusion by Western civilization. As Bernach's journey progresses, his conflicting emotions on colonial rule become more and more obvious. And this is his sketch of, it's called On the Road to Malabar, the Dessa houses, which show Dutch flags. And there is one last quotation. It was for the celebration of the Dutch crown princess's birthday. And then it triggers this prophetic statement. Once again, I was amazed by the fact that a country so abundant in nature, bearing no resemblance whatsoever to the motherland and the, uh, the Netherlands, could belong to that same nation. For one wonders instinctively how it is possible that they still concede us this possession. Will the Netherlands keep it until the power of some volcanic force of liberation causes the entire Orient to free itself from the West? He was thinking this in 1923. Well, this was the last quotation I wanted to share with you. And so on 27 June 1923, Berlage, he embarked on the, the boat, the, the ship that would bring him back to the Netherlands or to, to actually to, to, to Italy and um, on the port of Belawan, Sumatra, to leave behind Indonesia that he knew he would never see again. And this is where my introduction to you also ends. Um, it has been short and limited, I realize that, but I hope I offered you some appetizing fragments and food for thought and dialogue that we, that we can continue later. That's what I wanted to tell you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Petra Timmer, for the very incredible presentations on Berlachia. So you've uh, presented um, 
first fun introduction of the Verlache and then the works and uh, you know how he became the pioneer in uh, modernism and um, uh, his views on architecture and also to the society like uh, socialist uh, uh, what's that uh, uh, ideas uh, through architecture yeah, yeah. and then uh, you talk about the two buildings that uh, Berlaha designed which is in Surabaya and Jakarta and we have some question also on, uh, yeah. on that matter but we'll do it later so for the audience please write down your uh, question if you have uh, through a chat room here chat box in zoom and don't forget to put your name and uh, your uh, affiliations yeah and then it's also interesting that uh, you know like uh, Berlaha um, designed the building in 1910 in Surabaya right oh, sorry that one in yeah. that's yeah. that's 1901 yeah and then uh, um, after that there's still quite a lot of uh, journey in, in the architectural thinking that also shifts the idea uh, his idea of architecture which is not only one you mentioned like maybe five or more in, in the list. And it's also interesting, perhaps, uh, in uh, the, like the other way around, like perhaps the journey, one of them uh, and, and the Netherlands in this also shaped the whole idea into uh, what we know about Villach as, as modern, modernist architects. Yeah, so it's the other way around. Okay. Uh, like it's not only the Lache that um, influenced uh, the architecture in uh, Indonesia, but also what he experienced during the journey that also shaped the whole idea of his architecture. <laughs> and then uh, I think uh, I also recognize some of the quotes that you mentioned uh, at the end, especially the one with Tari Srimpia. Uh, like it. Show, it shows that a strong spiritual layer that comes from the travel and like the Dutch will never have that kind of spirituality mm -hmm. like by showing the movement etc. Yeah. This is very uh, strong to me that uh, the idea that it's um, in a Berlaka characterized this idea by pulling together the universal qualities of modern or western modernism with the local spiritual, spiritual aesthetic elements. Yeah. And then it's not that he then uh, divided the two into kind of like separate ideas, but still developed that into what we know about perhaps in uh, his design later on in uh, exchange building, for example. Yeah. But I'd like to know more about uh, the Indonesian sides of the work of Berlache and also uh, his thinking and maybe some of the reactions and initiatives that um, uh, maybe not initiative, like we, we usually understand, uh, you know, uh, the influence between two, like between architects, but one for, uh, in Europe and the other one in Indonesia, and how this actually uh, understand or maybe have potentiality you know, to, to kind of understand um, uh, architectural idea and uh, the significance uh, or the in new interpretation perhaps to our to Indonesian architecture. So uh, then we will we'll move to the second uh, session which is yeah. the discussions yeah. Thank you so much for okay. your presentation. Okay uh, one moment. So uh, to complement the presentation of Dr. Timur earlier, so we have a discussion session and let me introduce you all, participants to our distinguished discussion, uh, Pak Budi Sukada. Uh, Insignia Budi Adelar Sukada, Grad Hans, Triple AA, EIE, yeah, got uh, his um, undergrad degree from uh, Department Architecture, Universitas Indonesia, and then he got the graduate honors diploma in History and Theory of Architecture from the Architectural Association in London. Yeah. Uh, Budi is also a practicing architect up to now and uh, works as partner partners in some architectural bureaus such as PT Perencana Jaya and Bujo Architects in Jakarta. Uh, he worked on some projects like research in Kepulauan Seribu and also involved in master plan in Kota 
Mamberano, Papua, and uh, some housing design in Menteng, yeah, and also office building in Kebayoran Baru, and also master plan in Mandalika Resort in Lombok, Nusa Tenggara Barat. Yeah. He's now also, uh, he teach um, architecture at Universitas Tarumanegara, and he was the chairman of Indonesian Institute of Architects for two periods, from 2000 to 2008. Yeah. So without further ado, we will start our discussion session. Pak Budi Sukada, the time is yours. That's for my wife because she was watching the session. I teach architectural history at DC University. And Gu Yulia and Professor Kermas was my students. And when it comes to the period of uh, the, the 20s, I always start with the latter. Because uh, according to Kent Frampton, there are six uh, tradition, uh, dominant traditions within the architectural discourse at the time, and it started with Berlach, and he called it the early functionalism yeah. that then distributed everything to all of the other uh, trends at the time. But that's it, because we don't have any other materials concerning Berlach after this time. So thank you, because you gave us more uh, uh, more uh, uh, significant materials concerning the latter, and then uh, many teachers in architectural history will, will get the benefit of it, not only in the East University, but also throughout Indonesia. So, thank you for the, all of the members of the team for their hard working. But then I have some uh, numbers of uh, Comments. The first is uh, uh, surprisingly, I I know now that it is Berlacher who proposed the school of architecture <laughs> because uh, we we don't know it about. It. We just know that the first school of architecture was set up by. Uh, <laughs> No, no, so, so, it was set up by uh, a Dutch architect, Van Rongon. Oh, yeah. it, it was actually the latter who supposed uh, mm -hmm. the idea to Van Rongon. And we just know it. Okay. The second thing is it is a very comprehensive presentation as well. It, it covers who he is, what he has done, and how he did it, and why. So that covers the, the main element in the history. Mm -hmm. uh, who, what, how, and why. And in Indonesia, we don't have that kind of comprehensiveness because some of us know everything about who he is, mm -hmm. but don't know anything about what he has done. Yeah. And you have to show it all about the life. So, and again, thank you. And uh, the third point is the, the notion of spiritual spirituality and philosophy within the life. <clears throat> and then he also mentioned how he felt when he saw the film events. My, my, that, that, that triggered my uh, curiosity. Yeah. How deep is the feeling within the rationalists, yeah. such as the life? There must be a, a feeling, something, something very soft yeah. that, that touched uh, his heart. In, in doing something uh, by implementing rationalism. 
Okay. So that's my question, actually. And maybe we can discuss it. The fourth is, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the fourth is uh, the notion of silence versus noise, according to Berlacher. Yeah, according to you, when yeah. that Berlacher uh, uh, mentioned about the silence in culture, Japanese culture, yeah. in 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 contrast to the uh, noises in Western, you have to get you have to bring noise in order to be recognized. <laughs> but in here, yes, in Indonesia especially, you have to be humble in order to be recognized. Uh, that uh, I connecting it to the again the spiritual spirituality of uh, and philosophical uh, belief I think in in that, like how how is that uh, impossible uh, how is that possible to to be to be explored because we we have to know uh, whether. Uh, Berlaka would uh, be agree with uh, the, the things that we in the Gen Architects do at the moment. Uh, if you look at this campus, mm -hmm. there are new buildings yeah. in, uh, in adjacent to uh, the original building designed by me and my team. So I would like to know if Berlaka is still alive now. What he would say about it. And the question of what if is also a historical question because uh, many historians did that. Edward Carr, for example, questioned what if Napoleon uh, doesn't uh, cross the, the river and then what will happen? Then uh, in Indonesia, also, Professor. Mugroho Nato Susanto also said, what if uh, Sukarno doesn't proclaim uh, mm. the independence on, on August? Okay. What will happen? Will, will, be, will that be uh, postponing uh, independence or something else? So uh, that's uh, my uh, action with in uh, now I know, for example, uh, from my own point of view, that even the state Still. was also influenced by the Latin. Before I, 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 I used to separate uh, the position of the Latin and the state. Now I know that they are connected. Yeah, you know? they are. And I know how it is connected. But it, it, it will be too long to explain, but maybe we can discuss it uh, later on. But now, uh, at least I know uh, my vocabulary is more comprehensive than, than before. <laughs> and uh, yes, that's all. I'm probably for my English because uh, the, the, the last time I speak in English is maybe 30 years ago. <laughs> and uh, usually it needs a bottle of wine to make it better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Bu Nuria. Thank you, Pa Buddhist Kadat. So you mentioned several things uh, as a comments, like uh, that's new information and insight also. Uh, for the talk and work of Berlach. One of them is like, uh, he was kind of like initiator of the School of Architecture. We know it's like uh, usually from Van Roman, uh, the professor uh, from uh, in Bandung, yeah, uh, ITB yeah. Uh, now, nowadays. And then uh, you also kind of like opening up uh, perhaps the discussion for today, not only about uh, who Berlach was, but also what, including, uh, you know, the thinking and then influences and also uh, kind of like uh, the work uh, uh, in architecture, yeah. And then there's also spirituality and philosophical belief of Berlacher and 
But then maybe this is the point uh, you need to uh, kind of like um, explore more. You know, how can this 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 is possible to be developed into the Lache in, in relation to we have that uh, influence from uh, the quotes that you have, and then we have the building that's showing perhaps during that time showing uh, spirituality like a bit, yeah, showing uh, local influences. I don't know whether this is spirituality or not, but then. Uh, uh, the rest of what you mentioned is not there because it's like 1901 and 1910, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe it, it uh, worth uh, explored a bit. And there's also a question um, uh, was that related to this one, like uh, uh, from Abimanyu Bandung. Um, so he missed kind of like info, like uh, you want to share about connection of spirituality, yeah, since the, uh, Belah when we left you work here, so maybe you, you can uh, explore more on that one. Uh, yeah, but first, uh, from some points that Abudi mentioned, you, maybe you'd like to respond first, then we can go to the spirituality as the sure. next one. May I uh, a little bit? Sleepy uh, is only one type of dance in Indonesia. Sorry? Sarimpi is only one type of dance in Indonesia. Dancing, yeah. yeah, traditional. Sarimpi? Yeah. 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 And it goes like this. The more it slow, the more the slower it is, yeah. the higher it is spiritually. Uh, but if the lack happens, what if the lack happens to, to see? Uh, uh, to 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 visit Batak, for example. The dance is like this. Yeah? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, not in Batak. In in in, in the north Sumatra. And if you uh, if you go to Bali, you will find a little faster uh, movement mm -hmm. with the eye moving. Up and down, and so that kind of feeling that I ask you, what is uh, the 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 <clears throat> what is the function of feeling within uh, the like the, the rational? Okay, shall I shall I stand yeah. and have a um, that's easier. Is this a good idea to just stand here? Um, well, let, shall we first talk? I, I don't know everything about Bernard, of course. I'm just also, for me, this was an exploration. And for me, it was partly new, but I found out. And uh, that, that intrigued us. So I can't say that I'm, I know everything about Berlage, but um, it's interesting to talk about the things that you mentioned. And let's start with your question about, um, well, the, the spiritual, the, the, the movement, the, the feeling, the, the, the soul that he found here. For instance, in the Serimpi dance, that is what he mentions. I think he saw more than only that. I, I, well, I really know. There was also Wyong um, uh, um, uh, shows that he saw several more, and I don't think that he really has described everything that he has seen in this journey. But this is a quote that that really touched me. I must say, when I read about him saying, "I was moved to tears when I saw these movements," and he had really a kind of, well, say, vision or feeling maybe without really understanding what was happening, that he realized, I can't understand what I see, but I, um, I feel that it is of a very high spirituality, of a high culture. And as a matter of fact, what I didn't show, because it takes too much time, but he compares it with what he knows that happens in the Dutch are in the Western ballrooms, uh, 1923. So there was tango, there was all kind of the foxtrot, there was all kind of dancing, which he thought, if you compare it to what I see here, this is ridiculous. This is the kind of decadence that he found in Western culture, and he 
get the idea. What I see here in the East is of a high culture. This is a true culture, it's a culture that is um, in complete, uh, how shall I say, uh, 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 coherent uh, with the society and with how people think and how they act and how they, uh, how they live their lives. And that combination for him was extraordinary. And actually it's a vision that he hoped for that could happen again in the West. That is the new society he was looking for. And he was, especially in Bali actually, but also seeing this Serimpi dance, that was the kind of vision that he had of a higher culture, the culture that uh, he was striving for. Of course, you can't um, transmit this culture to the West. No, it's an Eastern culture. It should stay here. Don't copy it. Just like all kind of neo styles, don't copy. Be of your own time and make your own culture that should be um, a natural and organic process that should start with a good uh, well, fundament. And these fundaments, that is what he was actually looking for, trying to develop. That is the style that he was trying to, um, well, to develop and what you see in the stock exchange. But about this spirituality of what you might think is how can I, how can you combine this with rationalism? Because rationalism, it's, you think it is, it is so rational. Well, that is of course logical to think in that way, but his rationalism, it, it um, contains also the other part, this balance that he was striving for, that he was looking for, a balance of the opponent of the opponents of uh, form and function, the opponents of beauty and cerebrality, the opponents of well, he saw also the noise and the silence, uh, and but you should find the middle of it. You should find um, uh, well, the, the, the synthesis of the different um, parts of life that you that you actually need both, but you have don't go too far in the, uh, the development of the rationality. Don't go too far in development of um, functionality of reason. Uh, if it's an important way to 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 explore, but don't. Uh, make it lopsided, don't make, uh, don't choose only for that part of life. It also needs the other part. And what is exactly the spiritual part of Bernage? I must really confess, I dare not say. I can try to to think it up, I can try to, um, uh, to make something, to interpret it myself, but I really should go further into the books that he wrote uh, about architecture and development of style, and then I think I would be able to give an answer to this question. But I know it's we have to find it in this solution in the synthesis he was looking for. Yes. Okay. And do you have another question? There were actually a lot of very interesting, intriguing questions and suggestions and, and remarks that I can't uh, repeat uh, exactly at this moment. But maybe you can give me one or two more that I can react to. How about the uh, what if questions? Sorry? How about the uh, what if questions? What if, what if? What if Malaga has uh, more opportunity or example? to do some buildings in Indonesia, what yeah. he will do? What he would have done? Yeah. Well, um, as I said, people were thinking, uh, there are people now who interpret the reason for his journey to Indonesia, to, or to, to the Dutch East Indies, I should say, uh, that maybe he went there because he was looking for new commissions because it was kind of economic low tide at that time. He didn't have a lot of work at that moment, which also gave him the opportunity to go away for three months. He didn't have at that, at that moment a commission. So um, uh, that might have been a reason. And I think 
Part of it is true, but the, the most important reason that he went there is exactly as in his quote, it is my dream to, he expected this, but he it lived up more to his expectations, what he found here in this culture and, and the, uh, uh, the original culture of, of the Indies. But, so that is what he was looking for, but maybe he also wanted to have new conditions and there is one reason that it that it's correct to say that he was interested in the urban planning. He already had he, he was lecturing. He had four lecturers with him that he could um, uh, well in Bandung he uh, for the uh, for the, the technical high school he had a lecture about the bridge the bridge uh, as a technical and architectural uh, subject in in the Netherlands in in the west but also in the east. Um, but there was also a lecture about developing the city of Amsterdam. So that is also about what he did in 1915, this, this design for, um, for, for Amsterdam, the southern part of Amsterdam. And he did this in Kunstkring in Batavia, in the building of Mooien. And he made a comparison with the, the layout of, um, um, and also the extension plan for Jakarta, for, for Batavia. So I think he was then already thinking about a new commission from the city of Batavia for, for this extension plan of, um, uh, of Batavia. They were already working on it. And you believe it or not, but afterwards he got this commission not to make a new a plan, but to advise about the plan that already existed. And he more or less, uh, um, uh, he made some new drawings, but also the plans that there were there, one of them was Carson, and he, of, of Thomas Carson, he proved it with some additions of his. But that was a commission that was very well paid for and that he was criticized for too. So that is part of, well, an economical reason. And um, if you say, what would he have built if he would have been there? Well, I think this is just an, um, um, uh, I'm not sure, I can't prove it, but I have the feeling that he is not writing about these, for instance, the building in uh, Surabaya, because he realized that um, when designing this in Amsterdam, he lived in Amsterdam at that moment, um, designing this for the Algemene, this insurance company, um, uh, he did it from Amsterdam and he wasn't in Batavia. And afterwards he realized, I should have been here to realize what are the conditions, what is the, what are the tropical circumstances, what is actually needed here, that is living up to his own rational uh, 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 rules, you might say, and he realized that he didn't live up to these rules himself when he did this. And I think when he saw his own building, he might have been very critical, and that might have been the reason is it modesty or is it that he didn't want to write negative about his own building? That I don't know. But if he would make a new building here, and this is completely my uh, interpretation, um, reacting to your question, if he would make a new building, I think he would um, trying to uh, he would be trying to find uh, well in a way such as uh, Karsten and uh, McLean Pond they were searching for indigenous materials and indigenous uh, constructions and indigenous forms. And that as a starting point, and then to, well, actually in a functionalist way, almost form follows function, but the, the function is so different that you also have another form. So you don't make an, a national, an, an international style that you can bring everywhere over the world. No, that is not his idea. You should, and that is kind of, you might say, a regionalism. He is, he is actually, the, 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 uh, the term didn't exist at that time, but he is kind of regionalist. That is what he is looking for. That is a consequence, you might say, of his rationalist style. He is a predecessor. That is how I feel it, how I interpret it. The predecessor of regionalism or a critical regionalism 
how should you go on with developing a style that is um, uh, apt and uh, uh, that is good for, for a country like Indonesia, that, is, that you should use here. And I think in that direction, he would make his designs. And that would be a very different Berlage design that wouldn't look like his buildings in, 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 in the Netherlands because of the tropical circumstances. So it would be a nice idea. What would he, how would, how, how would he have made that? What would be the outcome? It's a fantasy, but it's a nice fantasy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the replies. And I, I would, I'd like to go to the questions from the audience. Yeah. One is related to what you just mentioned. What if, yeah. Uh, this is from Risky Jovans, yeah. Like, uh, th there's also some question from the audience that willing to know about is there any influence uh, from Berlache to uh, the architects that built in uh, 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 Netherlands in this, yeah. And then uh, specifically about the Surabaya, maybe you have more information how did uh, Berlache got the commission to build. You mentioned uh, a bit about like uh, the insurance uh, office, but maybe this is the curiosity that we can fulfill. And then, uh, and he never touched the ground of the, the Indies, yeah, and then how can uh, he get the, the idea to build like this one? And then I also got the idea, perhaps this show the kind of like reflection of regrets <laughs> from Berlaka that if I, if I know about the place, etc., I will uh, kind of like maybe uh, change the approach or maybe looking at the localities more, yeah. Okay, uh, perhaps you can address something to these questions, like uh, um, the background, uh, hmm. how can uh, Berlaha get the commissions, and then how, how then he reply to the requirements, yeah, and then also uh, like further perhaps story that this is uh, something that he have no idea about uh, Surabaya or uh, the Indies. Thank you. Yes. Well, about this building in Surabaya, what I didn't mention, but it is um, quite commonly known, that this building for um, uh, the Algemene in Surabaya, I think it was their head office. Um, two things. Berenage already had a commission to make a building, a design for the head office of the Algemeen in Amsterdam, just across um, uh, the, the stock exchange. It was even before the stock exchange was realized, he already made a design for the head office of the Algemeen in Amsterdam. Uh, he was, uh, well, he was already at that time a very important architect who often made designs for insurance companies. There are more. Uh, the, the other one in, in Batavia is the Nederlanden van 1845, which, <laughs> well, the Netherlands of 1845, um, which is now a completely different kind of, uh, different name it has, it still exists. But that, um, the director of that um, uh, insurance company was uh, also a very Berlage adept, a very Berlage, uh, a very in favor of Berlage as a modern new architect, a very important commissioner for him. But also the, the Algemene, one, I think it was the biggest insurance company in the Netherlands at that time, uh, most important. So they had their office also in Surabaya, but this office design first was made by Hulsvoet. It was a design by Hulswood. And um, Berlage, already with his reputation, um, was asked to uh, assess this design. Um, how this really happened, I'm, I, I'm trying to find out because I'm intrigued by it now. Why, why did it happen? What happened actually? But he was asked by the Algemeene to in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, to have a look at this design by Hulswood, who was an architect in the Dutch Indies at that time, to have a look at it and to, um, uh, well, to evaluate it, to, to, to say what he thought of it. And then he saw the design of Hulswood and he said, no, it's not good. He rejected it. So then the Algemeen says, okay, Hulswood design, we don't use. Hulswood 
make another design. He made a second design by, um, uh, well, some uh, adaptations by Berlage. He said, well, change this, change that. That happened, he made the second design. And then again, Berlach was asked to give his idea, his, his, uh, um, uh, what he thought about the, the design of Hulswit. And again, he, he said there should be some alterations. And then Hulswit resigned. He said, okay, I, I don't feel like it. I don't want to finish this. And he even left Surabaya and went to Batavia. Well, Hillswood, he, he worked with, with Kuipers and, and Fairmont, so I think that that's not too bad for him. But his commission with the Algemene finished, and then the Algemene asked Berlage to finish the design by Hillswood and to make his own design for that building. Well, one of the things he did is Hillswood's design was asymmetrical. There was, the, but now is the middle part and, well, the left order of the right side. But Berlach says it should be uh, symmetrical. So the, the, the left side was also in, in a symmetrical head, was the, the mirrored. The, the, another building had to be, the, be bought by the Algemeene and, and uh, uh, brought down to make this other part, to enlarge the building and to make it symmetrical. Um, as a matter of fact, at this moment, this moment, and there are people who might know more about it, but I don't know exactly what is left from the Hillslip design in the Berlage design. But what is absolutely Berlage is this tile tableau by Jan Torop, and also the lions by Mendes Acosta. Mendes Acosta and Jan Torop being uh, his uh, good friends and the kind of art or the kind of artist that he works with also in the uh, stock exchange. They had the same thoughts about well, a new society, uh, about socialism, about uh, a better society, a more just society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they lived in the same. They, they worked in the same way as Berlach did. So this is a Berlach feature. Um, uh, and what is the, the second part of the question about this design? This is what I can tell you about what happened and how he got this commission. Yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, mostly the land, but then you mentioned about um, uh, Verlaka kind of like idolized. Pierre Kuipers, yeah, <laughs> you can say idolize, perhaps, I, I, I can say idolize, but it's become, I don't know, love and hate, <laughs> like later on he, he became uh, opponents to the idea of what Pierre uh, Kuipers um, design, yeah, in race museum, and also, uh, actually, the, what's that, um, Kuipers have the biggest uh, architecture, Architecture Bureau in Indonesia, like the biggest uh, project in Dutch is in this, yeah. yeah. And all of them use kind of like using uh, new classical architecture, the one that is uh, criticized by Berlache in uh, Jakarta. Yeah. There are some questions here related to uh, the designs, like uh, what do you think about uh, the use of golden section proportion in the building and also uh, uh, Considering Indonesia as a tropical country, using this kind of European styles, yeah, uh, maybe you can have like insight on that uh, in connection to function efficiency of building. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions that I got from uh, the audience in Zoom, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you can, I uh, I understand that maybe you have more view in the. Uh, art history perhaps or yeah. or uh, and this is more into architecture but in in in, in a way what Berlaka has done is um, kind of like think about Gesam Kun's work you mentioned earlier that it's it's a, a unity of uh, art and also product and also architecture or building yeah. Uh, I don't know whether uh, this kind of like principle of architecture, building sections, and also uh, connection to the localities like tropical country also part of the, perhaps if it's not the consideration of the design, the thinking mm -hmm. that may happen. Well, let me see if I can answer this. It's, it's a lot of questions at, 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 at once, but um, 
uh, well, to, to refer to Kuipers, Kuipers Hills with, uh, Kuipers Fairmont Hills with, they, they, well, they, that it's not Kermont, uh, Kuipers Fairmont Hills with all the time, but certainly Kuipers, um, <clears throat> he's very critical, critical, uh, well, not very kind actually <laughs> about the, the building of, um, of Kuipers, this Java's bank. And now it is the, uh, uh, the Bank of Indonesia and the Museum of the Bank of Indonesia. And as a matter of fact, I think it's a wonderful building. I love it. Uh, it's, it's, it's big, it's huge, but for me for myself, uh, I, I really am not um, uh, against this kind of style. But for Bernage at that time, it was, um, uh, well, using Renaissance as an as a as an um, uh, a neo style, and in his view, and at that time, looking for a new uh, a new kind of architecture, a new style for a new society, this these neo styles, um, uh, and neo classicism, neo Renaissance, uh, neo Gothic, also, but there are also some Gothic elements of Berlage. You might say, but okay. Uh, sometimes it's hard to make a real, um, uh, well, to, 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 to divide it really, but still, um, all these neo styles or eclectic styles, the combination of styles that's often what was used in the 19th century Western architecture, this combination of styles, a mix up of styles, that is something that Bernage um, disapproved of uh, because for him it, it was not truthful and uh, it was not. He, he had the feeling we have to go back to the roots. We have to go back to an, uh, um, a sober but very solid style, which he found not in the Netherlands, actually. He found it in Italy and not in the Italian, the great styles, not even in the classical styles, but in, well, the, the Romanesque style, actually also a, a style with bricks not with marble and not with plaster, but before that. He saw that as a more honest and true style. And he didn't want to copy it, but he used the, 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 some of these elements for him to make a new style of very simple structures, but very expressive structures that he can give significance to a building. Significant, the tower, for instance, is a very important element in his, uh, as you can see also in his stock exchange. And there are, and you saw the, the building of the St. Hubertus, the, the, the hunting lodge, a very important tower. The tower is an expression of this architecture and uh, its significance for uh, what is the meaning of the, the function of this building. Um, but what about this, this Kuipers and, and Fairmont uh, building? Why is he so negative about it? Sometimes I think, shouldn't he have been? So he says about people being, um, uh, well, not very positive about Eastern styles. They don't understand it and they think, well, uh, it's not important and it's a bit strange and we don't like it. That was the feeling often about uh, in, in, in the Netherlands about Eastern styles. We don't understand, so it's a bit strange and leave it as it is. Um, that he thought um, as something, shouldn't we be more humble? Shouldn't we be a bit more on a, um, a modest towards such a great culture? We don't realize how great that culture is. So this modesty, and this um, uh, humili uh, humility that he expresses there as a criticism to his fellow uh, Dutchman, uh, he could also apply to himself. Shouldn't he be, that's what I say now, shouldn't he be a little bit more humble and a little bit more um, uh, less critical to a person like Kuipers, Vermont? I, in my opinion, he's, he's a bit too critical about them. But I understand why. I, I, I know what are his rules, what is his thinking, but maybe he should be a bit more, um, well, a bit, bit more elegant and a bit more friendly about it. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I'd like to ask some of the students that it's in the room, but before that, uh, I'd like to greet Esther van uh, 
Stickenberg, yeah. Uh, she's here. He's uh, one of the fellow initiator uh, of the Berlade Nusantara with Petra and uh, Angie. And uh, she's the founder of Urban Discovery and uh, I Discover that focus on heritage cities workshop in Asia. And perhaps uh, Esther wants to say something for mm -hmm. us, yeah. And later on, I also noticed there's Remco Vermeulen from Dutch Cultural Agency um, that stands for the importance of international cooperation and exchange based on reciprocity, inclusivity, and sustainability. Yeah? And uh, Dutch Culture also supported um, the first phase of Berlade Nusantara project. And perhaps Remco also would like to join us yeah. <laughs> for the discussion. That would be wonderful. Please welcome both. This one is I discover. I don't hear your voice. Yeah, uh, please highlight uh, oh. Miss Esther with I Discover. <laughs> I, 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 I Discover. discover. It's, it's okay. Yeah. Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Esther, hi. Hi. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> Welcome. It's, it's great to see, um, to see you all there. In such great numbers, fabulous! Yeah, um, I've I've been listening to the whole conversation, and I was just uh, saying to Angie that that maybe Petra, you can elaborate a little bit, responding to to some of the questions that I see in the chat box, the chat box, about um, how we've heard from some people here in the Netherlands, how they see influences from uh, perhaps his Indonesia uh, trip in uh, the architecture of Berlage here in the Netherlands, and particularly the, the Kunstmuseum. Maybe you can share a, a bit about those conversations we had here. That's what you asked me. Yeah. Huh? Um, well, maybe you can give one example that I can, I can react to that. Uh, Esther. Yeah, mm -hmm. particularly about, um, uh, because th there's some questions in the chat box about whether there has been uh, any impact, any influence from uh, Berlach's journey in Indonesia in yeah. some of the later designs of him in the Netherlands. Okay. Yes. Well, I can, I, I can react to that. Um, what often that people are, are trying to look for, can we see Indonesian elements in the architecture of Berlage after he came back in 1923 or maybe in later designs, we can see this. And um, this is what I also discussed with, um, for instance, his, his grandson, Max van Roy, uh, who, who just passed away, I'm afraid to say, but, um, and also with other people, that actually you cannot see the direct influence in elements in his architecture, say decoration, because that um, is not the way how he thinks that you should uh, um, uh, transform an influence into your architecture. But what you could say is that in his uh, last design, his last big design um, of the Kunstmuseum, the Art Museum in The Hague, um, someone said, and I think this is someone who has a, a very good feeling for this, um, uh, uh, that when he goes into that museum, when he starts, there is kind of a, a long, um, uh, how, how do you call it, a, whole, a corridor going to the museum. This is a corridor over the, the two ponds. Maybe you remember that we, I showed this one picture and I said, you see a reflective point at one side, but the other side is also this pond. And then you go by a long corridor that leads you to 
the entrance of the museum and he says, I can't prove it, I can't show it, but I have the feeling that this um, Indonesian journey, this influence of the East, I feel it is here. There is a spirit in this building that I, I feel it too. That's what he said. And it's someone that's also Indonesian background. So he might have been have some more feeling for that. Um, so th that is a way how you should maybe look for um, the kind of influence that you find in Berlager's buildings after he went to Indonesia. So not something that is very uh, specific, not something that you can put your finger on, oh, that is it, but it is something else. It's, it's an other kind of mentality in his designing. And, um, and actually, I am curious to know more about it. And I hope that in this period that we are starting now, Esther, this, um, uh, this period of talking with other people about Berlage, Rino Santana, uh, having all kinds of chats, meetings, uh, looking at, at, at the buildings again, that maybe we can have it as a question for ourselves and to see what comes out of it. At this moment, this is what I can say and I dare say about it, and I don't want to go any further at this moment, but I hope perhaps we can find more answers to it, to give it a more um, uh, a, a deeper insight into this question, into this part of Berlage's building. I think it's an interesting one. Yeah? You agree? Okay. Yes. <laughs> now, this is exactly what, what I uh, had hoped you, you would share. And, and indeed, I agree with you that this journey that we're embarking on now, where we are sharing um, some of the fragments of, of the diary, some designs of the building, some of the sketches, and, and we, we basically present those to people that are in the know from, from very different fields, from the field of architecture, from the field of art, from the, the field of filmmaking. Um, and, and then we try to look for these connections because perhaps they are not really pronounced uh, and, and, and very visible at first sight. Uh, perhaps we should look more even on a spiritual level than, than on really kind of an, 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 uh, a physical level. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's definitely worth um, pondering about. So that is what I really hope that this project will bring us. So thank you for sharing that, Petra. Okay, Esther, thank you for posing and to, for, for uh, bringing this, this reaction and this uh, suggestion. And, um, well, this is also a suggestion to, to the people who are here and are following us now. This is something we could, well, as you said, ponder on and go along with. Um, it's interesting for the Netherlands, and I hope it is interesting for Indonesia to, to find out these kind of things. So this cross-fertilization from Indonesia then to the Dutch uh, uh, design um, uh, in those years, and also the other way around. There are all kind of cross-fertilizations and cross-references, and also from the history then to the, uh, to the practice of today. That's another one. Yeah. Okay, thank you to all of you. Uh, before I, I go to the students here, uh, is Remco there? Maybe you can like... We just, we just saw him. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so now... Oh, Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remco, hi, how are you? 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 Kalimat, gitu ya, mungkin, uh, especially for international cooperation exchange, maybe not questions, yeah, I don't know, uh, because this is a, a good initiative, you know, uh, like it's a daring talk uh, to look at what happened, I mean, the significance of the work, and then the two parties, perhaps I say, and Netherlands and Indonesia, you know, can start to think about, you know, more collaboration. Okay, please. So that's what you want me to comment on? It's, very oh, yeah. it's, very, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> no, I think, um, sorry, just to, uh, uh, what, we, what, I, what I do at Dutch Culture is uh, 
uh, like we we hope to support uh, projects such as this project uh, that give us new insights into the history that Indonesia and the Netherlands share, or the Netherlands shares with other countries. That most of the most of those countries were former colonies, and of course, it's not always easy to talk about this history because a lot of bad things have happened as well. And uh, luckily, at least here in the Netherlands, there's much more attention for these less positive aspects of this shared or this colonial history. Um, but what is interesting about uh, um, about Berlage's uh, travel diary and also this particular project, uh, like looking into this travel diary and what does Berlage actually say and what, it, what does it mean in this colonial context at the time, is that it gives us new insights into uh, you know, it was not a black-white situation. It was not where all the Dutch people were evil colonists and all the Indonesians were victims. There was also a lot of other stories and exchanges uh, going on. Um, so that's why I'm super happy with this project by uh, Petra and um, Angie and Esther and all, their whole team because they look at this travel diary with our current eyes but they also make it available because they have this work this, they've done this work in three different languages indonesian dutch and uh, english so that it's also becomes much more available to people such as young students from uh, ue so they can read by themselves what a person an architect like berlach wrote about the dutch east indies at the time and that's and and and, and also uh, they have invited several young Indonesian and Dutch uh, heritage and architecture professionals to reflect on this. Uh, and I think this whole discussion of getting a more inclusive look on history uh, is what makes this project so interesting. And also this whole discussion actually uh, that's taking place right now. So thank you, Ui, for hosting Petra and Esther uh, in, in showing uh, a little bit about their project. Thank you, thank you. I think uh... Thank you so much, Renko. I think oh, we can move to the audience here in the room, yeah? yeah? Okay. Uh, is there any question from students, please? Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Artyanti Hutuba. I'm from um, Theory and Sejara Architecture from Rudy. Uh, my kind of question is, I'm actually kind of interested with uh, what you've thought, what you've told before, like um, Berlache has uh, given advice or criticism or anything, it, what, whatever it forms toward Karsten and Pond, since like they, all of them were, came from the same culture, but talking about the buildings that they built in the Sampara and actually, have a culture of Nusantara. So it's kind of interesting what kind of atmosphere and dialogue that happens uh, during that time. Do you have any like um, any story about it? And I would love to hear a lot about it. Thank you. So you mean you'd like to lear learn more about this architectural debate in, in this, uh, in, in this, the context. Huh? The context. The yes, the colonial context. Um, well, I described it as um, it, it, it looks as uh, as is, as if it is about style. Uh, they both the the, the the style of of Wolf Schumacher, which is more European based, and saying um, we cannot use the Japanese original style because it's not strong enough to to go on with it and we have to use the european style the that the art deco style you might say that he used and um and developed that further uh and on the other hand there was uh pond uh Madeleine pond and and uh, uh, uh Carson who said it is very well possible uh, knowing about these, uh, the Japanese original uh, uh, building, especially the Pendopo as an archetype, as a topology that he that they wanted to develop further. But um, I have the feeling, and I'm not the only one, that it is about more than a stylistic um, antagonism. It is also about politics. 
It's also about how do you look at your role as an architect? Do you work for the colonial project? Well, they all did in a way, but certainly um, both Pont, but also uh, uh, Karsten, they wanted to build for the Indonesian people. And that is what Karsten, especially Karsten did. He tried to, he tried to make um, uh, an architecture, uh, uh, it's developed architecture for the Indonesian people living in this, well, as a matter of a colonial structure, but still he wanted them for, uh, you know, the, 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 the marketplaces, the passage that he designed about um, uh, housing that he uh, developed. And of course, as an urban planner, he made a very different kind of urban planning uh, that, that, that uh, relates to the, the, the colonial planning at that time. Um, so it has to do with uh, his vision of colonialism and the future of this, this whole project. And he is one of the guys who really thinks this has to end. We have to go to a new phase, to a, a, this is a transition, transitional phase towards independence. And um, that, well, that, that is what I, I'd like to add about this architectural debate. Um, of course, it is in a colonial context. You can't change that. You can't uh, extract it from it. Um, and what they really had in mind about what was going to happen afterwards, that, um, well, that it's hard to, to, to really to, 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 to understand and to find, to find. But I think there is a, a big difference between, well, the side of, you might say, the uh, Wolf Schumacher and this other side of Karsten and, and uh, uh, Madeleine Pond. Um, well, that is what I have to say about the colonial context. <laughs> of course, the outcome was very different from it. It was went a, a lot further than what they even had in mind. They couldn't imagine what happened later, but still, um, they were progressive. It's yeah. You mean the, the commissioners? Um, yes, the commissioners in in well. Of all of them, where the, the Dutch colonial, yes, yes. Yeah, well, and partly they were, of course, the, the governments in, um, um, well, he says they were the, the, the commissioners that were in the Netherlands who, who said, who told them and who paid them for what they were building in, uh, in Indonesia. And, um, but there were also governments, of course, yeah. but they were in, they were the Dutch government. The Dutch were building for themselves. You should keep that in mind. Yeah, and that was the difference with Karsten. He tried to build for the Indonesian people. He tried also to understand what they needed, what was their way of living, what was needed by them. Right. And that is what he tried in this kind of functionalist way, mm -hmm. what is needed for them, apart from the stylistic point, which, yeah. Thank you for uh, the question and answer. I think I, I need to apologize because I cannot read all the question, but I still have one more if it's possible. Okay, it's, it's only from uh, Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia. So Petra, you have the Berlaga principles, you shown uh, the Berlaga principles, which was formulated 100 years ago. What do you think is the relevance to today's architecture, but not here in Indonesia and Netherlands? What it means for architecture today? Well, what I know about this, I'm not an architect myself, so I can't, well, I'm, I'm, I'm um, not completely in the know of what, how this works for architects today. But what I know is that even today, architects are saying we feel inspired by Berlage, not in his stylistic way, because his style, the style of his works, of course, is from that period. And, uh, and uh, as I said about him, it's not a certain style that he propagates, but it's his thinking about um, uh, well, towards functionalism, you might say, it's thinking about um, uh, modesty, uh, truthfulness, an uh, um, earnest way to design uh, uh, your, your, your buildings, which uh, 
is heading for what we like to call functionalism and, and modernity. And um, as was said before, he made the difference, he made the, the turning point in Dutch architecture towards modernity. And he was not the greatest modernist, but he was the father of, uh, it was the beginning of modernism. Um, but I think he is still important. Um, this also, also had to do with this, this balance that he was looking for, this, um, to say it's both ways. And that was the discussion uh, um, we had before. Um, um, he is not a hundred percent rationalist, not a hundred percent functionalist. He is looking for the synthesis. And I think even today, it is important, uh, and it is kind of a, kind. It could be, and it can be, um, an inspiration for architects who are looking for. Uh, a more sustainable architecture and sustainability trying to find it in materials and constructions that are, um, uh, are, are used in certain circumstances and uh, are not international uh, uh, general uh, constructions that you could use anywhere but that are specific for a certain, well, using bamboo in Indonesia, for instance. Uh, and not using bamboo in the Netherlands because that, that that's, that's um, ridiculous, but using bamboo as a material here because well, this kind of uh, approach, you can, um, the, the kind of set of rules, this, this, his, his practical aesthetics and his theory um, might lead towards this kind of attitude. And in that way, he was then that is the greatest importance of Berlage. It's His importance is his theory, is his thinking, is his vision, more than his style. It's his vision, it's his visionary way of writing about it. All his lectures, his, his books and uh, articles that he wrote, and these were very, had very impactful. And that is where his, his um, uh, importance lies. And it even could work for today. I have the feeling for looking, there is now more um, uh, looking for sustainability. And if you look at Bernard, you might come to that conclusion too. I mean, he leads towards that way. Well, I think in that way, he could be inspiring for architects today. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much. So that's, I think, the end of the uh, sessions. Yeah. And um, what you've just mentioned, uh, the latest one is that. Perhaps by like revisiting the work of Berlach, you know, especially we have like a lot of discussion on spirituality, and also can go back to what happened in the Netherlands when they have when you there perhaps have a, a conversation or presentations. Yeah, like the effect can be here or there. It's like through the discussions, through this kind of forum, you know, we can have like like further you know relevance of the thinking of Berlach, and uh, so we have. Uh, we are coming to the end of the session, and uh, I believe that uh, uh, Anitya here yeah, has already recorded all the questions and they become uh, 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 things that uh, we can use for the input for, for uh, perhaps for their elaboration and uh, uh, collaboration, and also uh, in rethinking about the work of Berlach. Yeah. So, uh, everyone, uh, I would like to thank you. Um, Especially for the speakers here, yeah, for the interesting and uh, open mind um, presentation and discussions. And I'd like to close the forum also by thanking all of the participants for the questions and uh, everyone here in the room yeah, who uh, organized and uh, prepared everything. Uh, in our special talk series, one of the Department of Architecture, Universitas Indonesia. Hopefully, the presentation will be beneficial for everyone. Thank you one more time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore. Now I will return the session to our MC. Thank you, Bu Yulia, who already led the discussion. Also, Dr. Petra and Pak Budi Sukada for the fruitful discussion. Now we are moving to the next agenda. We would like to give certificates and souvenirs for the panelists. Uh, for the speaker, Dr. Petra, 
the moderator Bu Yulia, the commentator Pak Budi Sukada, also the representative of the Berlahari Nusantara team, Miss Angie. We invite all of the panelists to come to the stage and the certificates will be given by Prof. Hemas. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Okay, thank you for everyone. Finally, we come to the end of our special talk discussion, one more 2023. Thank you to all participants for joining this today's event and see you again at the next special talk of Wano Series 2023. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.